So what's the big problem with wealth creation? How do people like us, who didn't inherit a boatload of money, who are investing and building wealth from our own blood, sweat and tears, how do we invest in a way that gives us remarkable results and become financially free before retirement age? I don't know about you, but I am sick of hearing from wealth gurus and experts who don't walk their own talk and prescribe strategies that are a one size fits all approach. For self-made people like you and me, I'm here to tell you that you don't need to be superhuman or already wealthy to reach financial freedom earlier than 65. Hey guys, welcome. In today's episode, I want to unpack legacy and impact, and I want to do it from a charitable perspective. One of the things that I spend a lot of time talking to my high net worth clients about is this idea that they've built all this wealth and they really want to support and impact future generations and they just don't know how. A lot of people recognize that handing money to their children down the track may not actually serve them, in fact may hinder them. And there's also a recognition that if the right culture isn't created within families, then a lot of wealth dissipates very quickly. And so the running joke, which you may have heard, is that you guys will make the money, your kids will blow it up, the next generation has to start again. So this episode is definitely um, has a different bent, but uh, join me as I interview uh, a guy by the name of Kyron Johnson, whom I had the great privilege of trekking the Himalayas with last month on a charity trek um, as we kind of have this meandering conversation about infinite banking and how to really cultivate culture and impact in your family. Enjoy. All right, guys, I feel very blessed that today I have Kyron Johnson on with me. Kyron and I were trek buddies on the hike that I did through the Himalayas in October. Many of you know that I was fundraising for that. It was uh, one of the most epic adventures I've ever been on. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And when you are in that environment uh, with a small group of people, you you find yourself really getting to know people, getting to know who they are, what matters to them. And after that that big adventure, I felt like I really had to have you on, Kyron, and and kind of share a bit of our new and and your you know what you do and the experience as well. So welcome. It's it's awesome to have you on. Thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. Kyron, you came along as the representative of Opportunity International, which is a, a charity that I've been interested in for a really long time, but probably only started to make you know big efforts in the last year or two. I'll tell you really quickly how I got onto this trick was um, I was talking to your colleague, uh, Ben, and I said, oh, I'd love to really understand how you know the mechanics of this charity actually work. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> it's, a, it's a chance to go and, and do this adventure trek and then and do an insight tour. So I think I got a lot more than I bargained for, but let me, let me start that. That's like, a great way to put it. <laughs> I would love it if you could just do a really quick overview of who you are and who Opportunity is, because I think that would be, you know, give context to this. this yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, let's. I uh, will start with me. Okay. So I am the state manager for Opportunity in WA and SA, and I always add to that. Like it sounds super impressive, but I'm the only staff member for Opportunity in WA. So, but I manage any sort of fundraising or um, philanthropy in these two states. I'm based in Perth. I used to live in in Adelaide, and so Adelaide being my hometown, so like I kind of understand both states, and so I'm able to manage that. Um, and so I connect with philanthropists. I connect with people who are in business. I connect with families who just want to give and make a difference and help them find purpose in their giving and help them connect with opportunity when they give. Because nobody really enjoys just throwing money at a charity and then never kind of hearing back about what difference they're making and the impact and all that sort of thing. And so I help people align that. I've been doing this role for eight years. I really love it, obviously, because otherwise I wouldn't still be here. I, I get the benefit of um, you know working for a great organisation and also doing some great work in the world. My background is in finance. I started out my working life in banking in Melbourne. Uh, I was a business development manager selling financial products to financial planners and very aware of kind of who I'm speaking to um, and other people that may be kind of in this world. But it wasn't for me. I remember having discussions with financial planners and talking about the products that the bank that I worked for sold. And they'd tell me about how many millions of dollars I had in funds under management. And I just got to the point where I went, oh, that doesn't, 
I don't care about that. That doesn't float my boat. Like I need to find something that I'm I'm passionate about. And so I was able to do that and journey off into radio and um, worked for World Vision for a bit and then now with Opportunity. So it's very much for a for-purpose element of my, my career. I am married. I have four children ranging from 17 down to three, two boys, two girls. My three-year-old is not like my other children. I, I keep chatting to my wife. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this one. I haven't worked her out. Like I just, she's amazing and adorable, but I just, the, everything that I've been doing with the others is not working for her. So I've got to change the way that I parent, I think. That's an imparenting. Yeah. So that's me. Um, opportunity. Um, well, opportunity is, well, we're ending poverty, one family and one community at a time through the power of a small loan. We provide a small loan for women living in uh, India and Indonesia. They take that, they start a business, they put food on the table, send their kids to school, pay the loan back and work their way out of poverty. It's an empowerment model. And our founder, David Bissot, who started this organization from Sydney almost 50 years ago, not quite 50 years ago, he was a big believer in, like, he didn't like charity. He didn't want handouts. He wanted to be able to provide people with something that they could use and create something for themselves. Uh, and so there's some dignity and purpose in it. That was the most beautiful uh, explanation. I'm assuming you've done that a fair few times. <laughs> yeah, I, I have. Um, but it's, I don't know, I still I still get goosebumps, right? So, like, and, you know, we had an interview with our founder, David, a month or two ago. I still get excited about his vision and the kind of the way that he thinks like it's it's about lifting people up it's about providing something where they can take it and create something of their own and like it's it's the energy the only limit is the ingenuity and the creativity of the people that are involved and they just take this and run with it. It's extraordinary. Yeah, I love that. I would love to kind of give context to people listening to this as to why I think this is a really important conversation today. I'm someone who effectively I help individual families, individual people create the wealth so that they can achieve financial independence and freedom. Mm. I want to empower people to have a great relationship with money. So it might seem kind of odd that I'm interviewing you as someone who runs, you know, basically works in a charitable cause. The connection for me is that the idea behind financial freedom for me is it's not about wealth for the sake of wealth. It's about the, the freedom to choose, the capacity to have the impact in the world that you want. And I think too many of us postpone that idea till we're maybe too old to actually, you know, really put some thought into it. So part of my motivation for bringing you on today, and I know on our trek, I must have been the person that asked the most annoying questions. You know, I'm really interested in the mechanics of how this works. And I know in our community, one of the things that we spend a lot of time talking about is legacy, specifically in the context of wealth. We talk about, you know, how is it that you could take a dollar that's in your pocket today and still have it be working for you or having mm. impact in, say, 100 years' time? And the reality is that for most people, it's this great ideal, but you would probably know statistically what happens is the generation that we're talking about, they make the money, the kids blow it up, and then the, th mm. the next generation starts again. That's 98% of families, they go down that path. What really appeals to me about the work that you guys do is it is the first application of what I would describe as infinite banking in motion. And so for me, I'm at a stage of my life where I really want to start shining the torch on you know, organizations that have really come up with an out of the box idea. And and just for context, like David, your founder, was really a pioneer of this microfinance space, was he not? Yeah, he was. Yeah. The reason I think this is an important conversation for my audience is I want them to understand that part of the purpose of wealth building has to be about impact. And so I think you guys are a great example of that. Mm. And I think probably one thing that I haven't highlighted in, in our journey as well as an organization is the repayment rate. So when we lend these small loans, and we're talking like $160 Australian, can create a small loan. I think we haven't officially updated it yet, but up until COVID, we were at a 98% repayment rate. COVID's had an impact on on you know the world, obviously, but I think our repayment rate's going to drop down to 95% as a result of just that tumultuous time, which, you know, if you're kind of academically minded, that that's still pretty decent high distinction. And we're hoping to get back up to that kind of 98% repayment rate generally, but those those most of the loans get repaid and then recycled onto the next person. And so when you're talking about legacy and an ongoing sustainable impact, that's kind of how it happens. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we talked about was someone may have made a loan 
call it 45 years ago, mm. maybe let, let's call it $100. A $100 loan was made to someone who then used that to start a business. It was repaid, let's say, over two years mm. and got loaned out again and again and again and again and again. And I think um, some of the data you shared with me about how many clients you have, like it's mm. like millions and the impact and, and going over there and seeing firsthand how people have been you know, have started basically on the poverty line and then lifted themselves out of it was just extraordinary. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I got a ton of questions for you. I guess what I'd love to do is um, maybe start by asking you, in your experience, what is the what is the prime motivation that people have, let's say business owners specifically, mm. when it comes to why are they attracted to your model? What is the opportunity for business owners to be involved on an ongoing basis? Yeah, generally business owners uh, connect with us because of the business mentality, but also because somewhere in their journey, someone has done something for them and helped them when they probably not deserve it, but they, you know, they might not have been eligible for a loan and someone's jumped in and gone, hey, I'll just, I'll cover you for this bit. So somebody's helped them in their business journey. And so they look at themselves now and they're going, oh, wow, we've done so well. If not for that investment or if not for that person, I wouldn't be where I was. And so their mentality of, okay, how can I give back? How can I provide that same sort of experience for someone else? And looking at India and Indonesia specifically, you can do that on a significant field. Although you can take $160 and do that for someone and that's going to change the tra trajectory of their life and their family for generations to come. And so they look at us and go, well, I can do that on a, on a huge scale with opportunity. And so we see businesses getting involved through workplace giving. We see businesses getting involved through providing support for different branches in Indonesia. We see businesses getting involved by holding events internally like curry events and other ways and bringing opportunity staff in to connect their staff with the impact on the ground. And we know that the generations of kind of workers that are coming through at the moment want that. They don't want to turn up and just get a paycheck. They want to actually find some purpose in what they're doing. And so it's helpful for the business to, to fulfill kind of the generosity mindset, but also to provide a, a place of work where people want to work at. Um, it's helpful for the staff who turn up and find purpose in what they're doing. And it's also help, helpful for the world. That's a great response. I, I'd love to ask you a little bit in terms of like from a creativity point of view, what sort of structures and schemes and ideas have people come up with in terms of how they contribute? And they're, they're, I don't know if I'm making that clear enough, but like say, for example, some people peg their success to the amounts that they give away and some mm. people contribute a percentage of profits and what sort of creative ideas have you seen in, in that sense? Yeah, it's, it's those things like that's come some of the core elements of like some people are like, okay, percentage of our profits goes to, to opportunity. Some people are very much, I want to impact this many people. There's an ambassador here in WA and she her life goal is to impact a million souls, a million people. And that's kind of through different elements, but part of that is through her giving an opportunity. And so we're kind of helping her keep track of her impact as an individual of those in the world. Uh, and so they have specific numbers and she donates to us whenever she gets a new client on. And so it's just, it's really become part of her DNA in her business DNA as well. And so we become part of the culture. And we've seen some, some larger corporates, they would do a, like a massive quiz night and invite people and then they will provide matching funds for any donations that come on the night. And that's been a real key component over the last few years across a few different events. We have wine tasting events where businesses are like, excellent, we'll send some staff and we're going to provide some matching um, donation funds as well. So if someone donates $100, we'll match it $100 as well. So there's a few different things and financial components that people put into place. What about from uh, maybe a more family-based sort of structure. You know, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, essentially what the goal for a lot of our members is that they want to create a pool of investments that throws off enough passive income that they can mm -hmm. to live without worrying about, or, you know, and then so they can go on and have the impact they want to in the world. Yeah. So, you know, they're not necessarily extraordinary numbers. Sometimes they're fairly modest. Sometimes they're not. Often what happens is, and, you know, even I've experienced this, you overshoot the mark a little bit. And so there's this, uh, I guess, opportunity to take that surplus and do something meaningful with it. Have you had people donate through wills? Have you had people donate ongoing or what, what are the sort of models you've seen 
Yeah. So I've seen the wills is a fun conversation that I have with people because I encourage people to think about leaving a bequest in their will. And when I have confirmation they've done it, I'm so grateful and they become part of our sort of bequest family. But my first comment is, I never want to see this. <laughs> like it's it's such a wonderful way to, to leave a lasting legacy, which will create small loans and leave a lasting legacy, right? But I never want to see that. But that's such a beautiful way to give. And generally people that do that are also giving on an ongoing basis as well. There are families that will set up foundations, which they will give from. So like a like a PAF, like a, a private ancillary fund. And they often will include their children. So the next generation as directors of that foundation. And so they'll have a discussion as a family of, okay, who do we want to support? This one in, in a family in WA, again, that I, I connect with and we have conversations with fairly regularly of like, okay, what's going to be the next focus over the next few years? What are you guys passionate about? Um, in 2017, the parents of this family went to India with opportunity and I was on the trip with them and it was was lovely. Next year, there's a couple of trips happening, one to India, one to Indonesia, and two of the children of this particular couple will be going. So like it's coming down the, the generational pipeline, I guess, that the children are now getting engaged with the charity. Seeing the children, like the, the next generation switch on, I'm kind of reluctant to go there with this, but I, I know that the next decade or so, we'll see the largest transfer of intergenerational wealth, right? And you would know this better than most. And so to see families that are intentional about, okay, this is how we want our family to think. We want them to think globally. We want them to to do something positive to, positive, to leave a legacy, to be smart with their finances, but also to be generous at the same time. And so they're training the next generation through these sorts of methods. That is such a vital thread you've raised there. I think one of the things we talk about is traditionally, maybe a generation or so ago, there was no discussion of money. Mm. And what you got left, you know, at the we the reading of the will was always a bit of a surprise for people. And so, you know, from my perspective, from a values-based perspective, I think it's really important to be having those conversations about what is it that matters to you? Um, mm. How do you want that wealth to be set? And we talk about um, letters of intent or videos of intent where you can kind of create something that's, you know, going to be there for forever mm. so that your grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on would, would potentially see it. And so one of the big dilemmas, and, and I'd love your take on this, one of the big dilemmas of a lot of high net worth families is they don't necessarily want all of their wealth to pass to their children for the enjoyment of their children. They actually want the wealth that they've created to be used and that's why that that whole concept of infinite banking is a great one. So part of it might be that they want a family bank so that they can support kids, you know, people down the track that might have disabilities or special needs or all yeah. that. But a big part of it for a lot of people is I want this money to actually make a difference. And so, you know, Warren Buffett and, and people like that have already – been very outspoken, founder of eBay, about, you know, this wealth that I built will not be going to my children. And I think that's a new trend. And so I'm curious to know if you've been party to any of those conversations or, you know, what are some interesting things you've heard about how people are taking this on? There's a little bit of that and it's starting to come out more and more. I mean, generally the conversations around, again, going back to the, the wills and bequests, um, one of the things that I would generally say is make sure that you take care of your children first. But I've had conversations with people that are like, yeah, they'll be fine. They don't need anything. So I can, you know, just split that off. I think part of the methodology that I've seen with families is not necessarily just waiting until after they've died to then go, okay, this is what I want to happen. Those conversations, as you said, are happening now and they're involving the children in their giving. So it's now creating a new culture within that family so that the kids are on board and that just so that's part of the legacy that lives on. It's the legacy of generosity and of, of giving. One of the challenges that I foresee is that whilst philosophy of generosity will continue in the family, the focus may shift. So the parents may be very focused on a few different charities that they love, but the children might come on board and then go, actually, we are more interested in climate change, or so there might be some other focuses that they bring on board. And so I, I think it's probably best for the family to stay open to, okay, Generosity is our philosophy. We want to be able to give and make the world better. 
but we don't want to be too stringent on we must do it this way because as generations change and the world shifts a little bit, there might be some some different ways to look at things and the different ways to give. There's a fabulous video on YouTube, which I encourage everyone to listen to if they get the chance, which was an interview done by, I think it was the, uh, the grandson or the great-grandson of, of John D. Rockefeller. And one of the things that they have succeeded in doing within their family is creating that culture of giving. So mm. not for personal pleasure and benefit, but for giving. And so they eff- effectively all of their wealth sits in a foundation for the betterment of others. And so this idea of like, of course, people are going to shift in terms of what charities they want to support and so forth. But I do think that um, the culture you create in your family mm. is probably the single biggest factor that creates the difference as to whether that succeeds or fails and not leaving those conversations till the nth hour to go, oh, by the way, I really would love, you know, the significant yeah. moments to go on with you. Yeah. And I think as to just as a, a parenting note, there's no guarantee that your kids will jump on board and, and roll with it a hundred percent. So, but at least as tempting to create that as best you can. Yeah, that's right. I, I think the whole thing with money is um, we spend so much time thinking or a lot of people spend time thinking that they're building all this wealth because they want to help their children. Mm. And then they get further down the track and they realise that, you know, they're actually going to be doing them a disservice if they Mm. give that wealth to their children without letting them experience some friction themselves in, you know, in terms of real life. And so there's a pivot box sometimes later. And so I think this idea of thinking of wealth from the context of how can I have a greater impact? And the fact that your CEO, I think one of the things he said in the webinar last month is he was often accused of being a capitalist pig. <laughs> I don't know if you want to kind of expand on that at all. That, that was a great little anecdote. Oh, I, yeah. I don't remember the full ins and outs of it, so I can't quite speak to it verbatim, but just the the idea of of utilising money for the benefit of the world. Like it's money is not an evil right? It can be used for evil, but it can also be used for good. So there is absolute benefit in making a huge amount of it ethically. I think that's probably part of the challenge, yeah. um, making it ethically and using it for, for good so that it can do a lot of, yeah, bring a lot of value to people. I don't know if you want to comment just before we finish up on, you know, the trick itself and what we saw and what we did. Um, because, you know, for me, I would actually, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I would actually list it in my most memorable life experiences, top five. Yeah, wow. Extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah, I I would agree as well. So being not really an outdoorsy person myself, I- Oh, yeah, like, yeah. I, know, I had all the gear. Like you can, you can buy all the stuff and I think that is, goes a long way to you to becoming the type of person that is outdoorsy. I kind of- didn't fully know what to expect and I wasn't entirely prepared as well for what we were going to see. You know very well, like the, the second day was super challenging. It was a 1300 meter incline across what felt like 48 hours. It was, it was a long day. We were rocking to the tents that, that, like that night and they're all, you know, all set up. Everything's fine, but it's dark and we don't know what we're, what we're looking at. We're all tired. Everyone was grumpy and we just kind of had dinner and went to bed. And it was a cold night. You wake up in the morning and the sun is rising and you kind of come out of your tent. It's clear and you're seeing snow-capped mountains. And that was the first moment that I just went, holy cow, I am not prepared for this. Like I haven't actually built up to this moment where I'm actually looking at where Everest is and sleeping Buddha. And it was just extraordinary. So I think part of Part of that experience, again, I never thought I would be the person that would be walking through the Himalayas or seeing where Everest is, or, but then all of a sudden I'm like, this is where I am. I'm experiencing this. This is rare air. I just want to take it in. And I think for the next few days as I was kind of walking, I would intentionally stop and just breathe and just go, this is extraordinary. I don't think I'll ever be here again, so let's just kind of enjoy it. And that's that was kind of the trip for the whole whole thing. Oh, look, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the uh, the second day, you know, nearly killed me. Um, I've got I've got an image like cemented in my mind of like you just kind of meandering along and that look on your face and like oh, she's having a real tough time. This is not fun. Oh well, I think it was just the fact that the uh, we get get back in pitch black. But um, no, look, the the waking up the next day and 
apparently it's very rare to just be able to see the mountains very clearly. And we just had this really, you know, unique window of two or three days where it was just absolutely clear skies and you could see Everest and, you know, all the related mountains and it was just magic. And then to go on from that and Mm. really go into some of these villages where the women had, you know, really taken these loans and over many years not only built up a business for themselves but sent their children to schools, Mm. just transformative. And, And so I think what that's done for me is really kind of brought me one step closer to the cold face of recognizing the importance of wealth for impact and also that the pursuit of wealth is still a valid pursuit, particularly if those two things are connected. Again, one thing that stands out for me spending time with the the loan recipients those last couple of days was just the generational impact. Uh, We talk about leaving a legacy. The women would talk about their children who had gone to school and some of them were taking over and running parts of the business now, whilst they were running another part of the business, was just amazing and talking about their kids as not like if they needed finance, they wouldn't need to go and get like a small loan. They could go and talk to a bank. Like they're involved in the banking system now. So that is a huge transition from being unbanked to banked as part of the financial sector. And so they're not going to live in poverty. They're not going to have the experiences that they have. And I think as a parent, that's what we all want, right? Like we all want our kids to have a better life than we did. Not too comfy and cushy because we want them to learn and grow and all of that, but we don't want them to experience the the harshness, especially the harshness of what poverty has, um, has brought upon these families. So it was just inspirational and really exciting to see the difference that it was making for the family and the generations to come. I have a final question for you, which is a little bit left of field. You're a father of four with quite a span in terms of age. One of the challenges that a lot of my clients talk about, and I know even I experience it, is how do you cultivate gratitude in your children? It's it's a tough question because I I remember uh, we we took our boys to India when they were maybe six and seven or something like that. So they were old enough. Mm. And we took them on a bit of a walk through a very famous slum. We did an eco tour through a slum. And I mean, that was abject poverty. It was very, you know, all sorts of ecosystems and industry going on. It was, you know, it was was quite a a beautiful experience. But I could see the uh, experience from the boys' perspective was like, okay, we get it. Like, we understand. You know, it sort of felt like maybe we were, you know, shoving it down their throats. And so, you know, I think there's an intellectual gratitude. And then there's a, a real gratitude. And I'm just curious as if you've got opinions on this. What what have you witnessed in some of your donors or your own experience? There's a lot of people that I've talked to over a number of years who are like-minded to myself and care about kind of the world and care about people living in poverty. And generally I can pinpoint it back to a time when they were like 15 and they went to a developing country and saw poverty. Um, now, that's it's a fairly general age because, you know, girls and boys develop at the at different times and kind of boys, their frontal lobe doesn't develop until like they're 25 or whatever, and that's where compassion lies. So all, all of that aside, but generally there is something that's happened in their life where they've gone, oh, wow, this is not just about me. There's, there's, uh, there's a whole world out there um, and I want to do something to help. Now, there are those that have the same experience and just don't respond in the same way. So I don't know, like, like is, is the answer, like is um, just being, giving people the ability to have a different perspective or just be able to see the world. And I think it's going to maybe just bits over time um, as they get older into adulthood. If I had the secret, I would absolutely use it on my four kids, um, <laughs> but I don't. So. Okay. Let's see if we All right. Well, look, um, Corin, I'm, I'm so thrilled you were able to make time for this today. Um for me, you know, your organisation is one that I intend to have a very strong connection to in the years ahead. Um, and, yeah, I very much look forward to going on that next trek with you. That's awesome. Thanks, Selena. Appreciate it. If you're feeling frustrated that despite doing everything right in the property investing playbook and you're no closer to financial freedom, then head on over to incosiwealth.com to learn more about how you can use alternative investments to catapult your investing income and blend strategies to shave decades off your timeline to financial freedom. See you on the next episode.